What is the most used man-made material on earth? You guessed right, it's concrete. Look around, it's everywhere. Sidewalks, driveways, foundations, floors you stand on, and even entire buildings are made out of concrete. So why don't we discuss it more? In each episode of Concrete Logic, we will explore one concrete-related topic with the help from industry professionals that are shaping the future of the trade. We'll talk with suppliers, contractors, architects, engineers, specialists, and even some proponents of competing materials about their views of concrete and their vision of its future. Welcome to another episode of the Concrete Logic Podcast. Today, I have a returning guest, Robert Higgins. Robert, you had a very popular podcast, I will tell you. I got all kinds of feedback, positive, negative. When we discussed the vapor barrier and all that good stuff, got a lot of attention. So that was a good one. But if you all don't know Robert or didn't listen to that last podcast, podcast. He's a concrete consultant. He's been involved with professional groups, ICRI, CSI. He's done papers for the flooring industry. He's a moisture test instructor. And uh, yeah, he's been involved with different committees within the flooring and the concrete industry. And uh, Robert, did I leave anything out? Well, that pretty much covers it. He's been around a while and knows some, yeah. he knows a lot of things, but he, he agree, agreed to come on the podcast and we want to talk about concrete alkalinity and it's the issues that it causes with concrete. Do you want to get us started off, Robert? And I will try to, you, you talk above our head sometimes. So I'm going to try to bring you down to earth some, a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Cause no, you're good. When you're a geek, it kickies. That's right. We're That's... all concrete nerds that listen to this podcast. So okay. you, you're in the right spot. Probably the best thing to, to discuss alkalinity to start with would be the history of concrete. A lot of times, every time I read something, so Concrete's thousands of years old. Yeah, that's true, but not Portland cement concrete. Portland cement concrete is really the history of what we do because that makes up 95% of the concrete used globally. We know there's other uh, novel types and there's even some bigger, some even some very large groups like CTS, for example, that have a calcium aluminate cement, but they're still of the minority. So, right. What, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but what, so what we're talking about is Portland cement. And would you say that the history of that the type of concrete is roughly about a hundred years old? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's about, actually, it's about 200 years old, but it, it's fragmented. And that's what I wanted to point out is we have these different uh, milestones as we go through where basically the original Portland cement that we were dealing with is no longer what we're dealing with today. Okay. We're still using the history of what we used back then. And there have been no alterations to accommodate these changes. And I don't know why. And that's why things keep getting worse and worse and they're not being addressed. So, well, we're always doing what we did. So yeah, you're always doing what you did, but you're not getting the same product that you have. So you can't keep doing what you did. With the older technology, you have to address what you're dealing with now. So if we go back in the 1920s and actually really the 1950s is where their real first uh, significant shift was made, they started grinding the cement finer because they found that if you grind it finer, it will set up faster. And they thought, this is great. But in that discovery, they also found out that it generated a lot of heat and that showed it somewhat compensate for that and also had way more strength than they needed at the 28 days that they started to establish as being the benchmark. So according to uh, a publication in Concrete International, which is a C ACI publication, it was discovered and it was stated by Ed Monroe that 
the cement of, or actually the concrete in the 1980s had 34% less cement than the concrete of the 1950s. So if you mm -hmm. put them side by side at 28 days and broke them, it would still break a seal 3,000 or 4,000 or whatever they were designed for. However, the permeability difference was amazing. It was not in a good way. The concrete of the 1980s, they said, was upwards of 500% more permeable. So that was taken into consideration. That's not a good thing, folks. No, it is not. So what they started to do as the demands increased, they started putting some more cement back into the concrete. So instead of going to a course of grind, because they didn't want the delayed 28-day benchmark to start shifting to where they're not meeting those numbers, they just maintained a finer grind and they kept grinding finer and finer because it's called a blame a particle size, whatever they want to call it. But what happens, and this one I'm going to explain to people, and this is why alkalinity is so important. The smaller the grain of the cement, as it begins to hydrate, it spins off, it makes cement. The other thing it makes is calcium hydroxide. That's the main alkaline material that, that's a byproduct of hydration. Now, that is a material that gives the concrete its normal alkalinity, but that is not the prime alkaline component. Even though it is the focus, it is not the prime alkaline component. The prime alkaline component is actually contaminant. And that's, that's called sodium hydroxide. Now, that's, that stuff's nasty. One, it's very high in pH. If you have a pH that's higher than 12.5, it is probably sodium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide does not get past 12.5. There's some argument where, you know, the, where the, the geeks among us argue it can only get to 12.45. There's not too many things that are accurate enough to pinpoint it like that, except 12.5, because it, it, you're going to get some influences where it can change a little bit, but you want to see it at about 12 or higher. Now, when it gets to 13, you have a contaminant. Now, what that contaminant does and has been completely ignored when, when concrete's being developed and uh, trying to cure it is that it has an inhibiting effect on the calcium hydroxide. It makes it insoluble. Now, people think that's no big deal. It is a big deal because about 85, between 85 and 90 percent of the hydration creates cement. 10 to 15 percent of it creates calcium hydroxide. That also covers part of the cement particle that hasn't hydrated yet. In the presence of sodium hydroxide, it becomes insoluble. So it doesn't react, it doesn't absorb water. So that actually inhibits the water contact to the cement particle that needs to be hydrated. And that hurts the hydration of concrete. So it said, just keep it wet. That's all, that's all well and good. But what happens as the cement's developing, when you're trying to keep it wet, when you put water on the concrete or carry it some other fashion, the understanding was, and it was an incorrect understanding, was that the water will allow everything to hydrate and we keep it above 80% relative humidity because relative Relative humidity is really the, the, the barometer that tells you whether or not cement development is occurring. It has to be above 80% relative humidity. Otherwise, cement development stops, no matter how much water is around, which sounds strange, hmm. but that's yep. how it is because what happens, it becomes, it goes into this equilibrium thing that's not being addressed properly. And it's causing a lot of issues that I'm not going to covering this podcast, but it lends itself to these other issues that are being investigated. Uh, so what happens as a cement particle develops, it consumes the water that's available. What it also does is it reduces the amount of water, which concentrates the alkalinity. Now, by concentrating the alkalinity, that brings the relative humidity down. There's a reciprocal reduction of humidity as the concentration level of the alkaline material gets higher. For example, and 
That's what bothers me because I read this at this National Institute of Standards and Technology study with a was state of the art report in 1999, and I thought it was very interesting that they felt even back then that uncracked and uncurled concrete was probably unreasonable expectation of concrete. And we've been told different. Mm -hmm. Very well. How, why wasn't this being conveyed? It wasn't being conveyed because they didn't know what was causing it. So basically, I'm going to give you the root cause of what causes that. This is where it starts. So, yeah. So if we look at that, and I'll go back to the NIST study. When that study came out, it said that sodium hydroxide as a concentrate lowers freezing point of water. That's true if it's really dilute, but we don't have that anymore. Because now we're gonna fast, we, we don't have that anymore because when it's diluted, it's when all that water's in there. What happens is as the water gets consumed, it gets concentrated. And what happens is it changes the properties of the water. The water now starts responding. Look, if you look at the freezing point of water when it's when you put sodium hydroxide in, it looks like a drunken mosquito. It goes all over the place, but it tends to go up. So what'll happen? And I found this in desert climates where they couldn't dry the concrete out. And I said, why can't we dry the concrete out? They couldn't dry it out because the concentration level of sodium hydroxide towards the surface of the concrete. When we when we took samples of it, the lab said it was between 15, 60% concentration. When it gets to 40% concentration, the freezing point of water climbs to 59 degrees. It's no longer 32 degrees. Huh. But everybody's treating it as that. They're not looking at the complexity of what's going on. So this creates a cascading effect where assumption upon assumption is made and they're not dealing with the root cause. Then as it concentrated further, you can actually get the free, you can actually push the freezing point of water past 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And just by without that, I tell them, go look at the bulk usage and distribution of sodium hydroxide. They keep it at 40% because at least that's manageable. But in the bulk distribution of sodium hydroxide, they heat the tanks and lines so the water doesn't freeze. The sodium hydroxide and water doesn't freeze in the lines. Or in the tanks, so otherwise it wouldn't be able to deliver the product. So that's just salt, right? Yeah, it's a salt. It's a, it's a metallic salt, but it's very. It has almost unlimited solubility, whereas the calcium hydroxide has limited solubility. But here's this. Here's another sticking point. The calcium hydroxide becomes less soluble as the temperature increases. So when you're Placing concrete in sunlight, you got radiant heat, and the sodium hydroxide's concentrating, that's dehydrating the, the concrete surface. They call it self desiccation. I was called out on that, so, well, yeah, that's ridiculous. Everybody knows that it, it doesn't do that, blah, blah, blah. Study after study globally is showing now consistently that the top one inch of the concrete is dehydrating and that self desiccation is bringing the relative humidity. And the top three quarters of an inch, one inch of the concrete down to 50 to 60% relative humidity. So I was correct. The hypothesis did work and it's happening globally. Now yeah. let's fast forward to 2002. The EPA attempted back in 1990 to have the cement producers recover the flue gases. This one massive concrete producer or cement producer so i can't do that it'll put us out of business because we our main business model is low alkali cement so they gave them enough time to switch so they started to implement this in 2002 so gradually all the different cement producers finally uh, conformed to this and it was uh, apparently pretty much 100 percent conformity to the EPA restriction. Now, what really bothers me is this is underreported because they said no, no more low alkali cement. Why? 
And I read two articles on that, and they don't explain why. They just say it's not there anymore. And they also don't in, impress upon us how important that is because they don't understand it. The higher alkalinity triggers this where this dehydration is occurring so quickly, it's happening in the first two to three weeks of concrete placement. So no matter how much water you put on the concrete, it will still dehydrate. Because huh. what happens is, well, it equalizes. Yeah, but that's called relative equalization. You can have a dry spot right next to a wet spot if it's alkaline. So they're in an unsteady alliance there. So what happens, you can be putting water on it all the, all, all the time, and that's not going to help. So there's been this big push towards internal curing and self-curing concrete, which I completely agree with. And they found what's really ironic is these absorptive aggregate used to be considered bad news for uh, floors and uh, other types of concrete because these contain water. And it was assumed, not verified, but it was assumed this added to the water cement ratio. It did not. Because as long as it was sur- if it's saturated but surface dry, if you put this, uh, saturated aggregate into the mix that gave these internal uh, curing points in the concrete that gave concrete a, a greater density and it had a more complete development of cement because now right. you have a water source inside, not just on the surface. Mm-hmm. So you have it scattered through, but it's uneven. So they're finding out that if there's not enough of this, which there can't be because they can't put in enough aggregate to really compensate for the, for the differences, what happens is they get different strains in the concrete. So they're doing areas of drying shrinkage, but some areas are staying, staying in this 12 position. So what will happen is it creates strains that start to crack in the concrete. So they're finding that doesn't cure it, even though it's helped the concrete increase its durability. It's just frustrating because they're not dealing with it. They're looking at the 28-day strain. A 28-day strength evaluation is almost, in my opinion, worthless without a 365-day strength analysis on the same exact mix design. Because what will happen if you place concrete in the hot weather, say it's 90 degrees, the 28-day strengths will be really impressive. But you'll have a reciprocal reduction at 365 days. But again... Study after study, they stop 28 days. They don't do the evaluation 365 days. So in my opinion, those are inconclusive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've actually improved the concrete because there's no verification at at one year. The industry should require 365-day verification. 28 days, fine, good. Now we got this. Now you have to complete the study. And and everybody stops 28 days. So basically, we're in a hamster wheel. We keep reinventing the wheel and not going any further to, to verify whether or not these studies and these techniques that we're adding to the concrete are really as helpful as we're hoping they would be. And this is all just to catch up with you here. So we're, we're, we're talking about calcium hydroxide. Is that right? Yes. Calcium okay. hydroxide is a natural alkaline component created by hydration of cement. It's also known as hydrated lime. Is that yeah. right? It's also called Portlandite. Yes. Okay. And this is, is that different from the limestone? Yes. That they put it? Limestone is calcium carbonate, hopefully. Hopefully you don't use sodium carbonate because that can create all kinds of issues, but I don't know. But, okay. um, but the limestone, yeah, it's different and I'm not a fan. Right. Yeah. We're learning as we go here. <laughs> all right. Getting- can, can you, can you go back to, uh, again, you mentioned it, the c- cement kiln dust. All right. Can you go back and uh, I guess maybe explain again how this has impacted the cement process and why it took that manufacturer cement manufacturer so long 
to agree to do it? Why were they not on board initially in the early 2000s? Okay. Oh, thank you. You, Yeah, you got to reel me in sometimes because I get off on these tangents. When it's called cement killed dust or CKD for short. All right. Um, well, CKD was, is produced. It, so when they recover the flue gases, part of that recovery process, they wanted the cement killed us, at least some of it to be reintroduced into the cement process. And that's been done. Now. Why did they want that? Uh, cause, cause it reduces pollutants, not just carbon dioxide, but pollution, uh, because there are other pollutants that it was releasing into the air. So they wanted them to recover that. And, okay. uh, there's no consistency with this because when you locally source minerals, they're going to have natural variations in alkalinity and other chemical uh, makeup for right. one part of the limestone in say Dakota and the Dakotas will be different than Northern California, Northern California will be different than Central California and so on. So when you go to the different regions, there's going to be variations. So when they recover the cement kiln dust, it does the alkalinity of the cement considerably. One estimate, which I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't screenshot because this page has been removed from the internet, which that bothers me as well, showed that some of this alkalinity was increased by over 400%. Now, here's the thing about alkalinity. It doesn't necessarily reciprocate with a pH test. Everybody uses the pH test. Look, it's in the 13s. Yeah, but it 13 what? Because when you look at the pH scale, that's, that's a logarithmic scale. A, a 13 in it to a 13.2 is twice as alkaline. And then you go from 13.2 to 13.4, that's twice as alkaline. So that's a bunch. That's just a minor change. That's a bunch. So if it gets four times more alkaline, it's instead, even though it'll measure 13 on a pH strip or pH meter, whatever you want to use, because these things are not all that precise, that that's hidden out in the open. So it can be more concentrated, but it's not as damaging. Because I've shown this where I've taken uh, sodium hydroxide if you get Drano, the, the powdered Drano, that's sodium hydroxide. I took one tablespoon of that, put in a couple of hours, stirred it up. It hit 13. I put in nine more tablespoons, stirred it up, was still 13. Now, the one tablespoon, I could put it on, on a painted surface and nothing would happen. When I took the, the concentrated, I put it on a painted surface, it dissolved the paint. Mm -hmm. Now, that concentrated material will also dissolve rock. It will dissolve anything that's amorphous. Cool. So even though it's 13, it can actually dissolve rock. It'll actually create its own sodium silicate in the concrete. And that kind oh. of sodium silicate is expansive. We're causing damage to our own concrete by adding this crap and then by it dehydrating like that, it's concentrating towards the surface. So it's the top inch of the concrete is suffering. Now, what was really interesting is the Texas Transportation Institute, uh, Dr. Dan Zollinger did a study on this and he decided to look at uncured versus cured concrete in the laboratory study. So he did uncured concrete, he did cured concrete. The cured concrete was water cured in a lab under laboratory condition for seven days. Since he was curious about the gradient portion of the concrete, which is the top inch, he went ahead and sliced off the top inch of the concrete. Even after seven days curing, water cure, it was 20% weaker than the remainder of the concrete. Now, here's where we hit our heads. In the compressive value test, when you crush concrete and crack it, mm -hmm. that's like compression can have with a weakened surface will not show up in the test. That goes hidden. A good way to value it is probably a rebound hammer, but that's been discredited because it always shows that the concrete's weaker than it is. Actually, it may have been showing us exactly how weak the surface was compared to the rest of the concrete. So there, there may be a value in there that we, that's been hiding out in the open. Yeah. 
So the, Dr. Zollinger proved that top inch of the concrete was considerably weaker, even with a seven day water chair. And this is going to get worse because as concrete's placed in the field and subject to uh, radiant heat from the sun, we're going to get worse and worse concrete. Now, what's bothersome about this is the ready mix producers are required to uh, disclose anything that's in the concrete, such as if they have a plasticizer, or they put in fly ash, anything like that. The cement producers, I have not seen any requirements of what they have to disclose because they are adding cement grinding aids. And some of these grinding aids may be actually interfering with coatings and floorings because some of these grinding aids are amine based and glycol based. These are not stable. They can migrate through the concrete. So we're, we're adding all these complexities and there's no data on what this can actually do to your concrete. So if we address these issues and we show how to deal with them, because these can all be compensated for if we make the concrete self-curing. So I'm a big proponent of that. If we make concrete self-curing, and I, I, I really don't want to get proprietary, but I have to, because I investigated the, uh, the different uh, the compounds and the different additives and things of that nature. There is a nanocoidal silica that I saw that blew me away. They did an analysis in Purdue University, and for the very first time that I've ever seen the, the surface of the concrete is actually denser than the remainder of the concrete, not, not weaker, not more porous, not more permeable. In fact, the density improvement was about 80, 78% over that of standard concrete. That's waterproof concrete. Yeah. That is con and, and it's not expensive. The, the stuff costs less than a shot blast. So if you have this into the concrete and you produce waterproof concrete, all this stuff is no longer applicable because what happens is the alkalinity within the concrete is no longer mobile. It's not collecting. It's not going through these capillaries. It can't concentrate. And by adding a water source, which these little things do, because if you look at a coil silica, it contains its own water. So as this reacts, it releases water. So these things are tiny. If you take uh, a five gallon bucket of colloidal silica, the comparative, uh, I like this one comparative that I read about uh, from this research, uh, research uh, company, where they said that the equivalency of, of an entire football field in surface area in a five gallon bucket. So that surface area put, gives an evaporable face by a, by evaporating water inside the concrete, you naturally cool it. So it takes care of the water source and it takes care of the overheating, which are the two deadly uh, combinations for concrete today, because it is the top inch of the concrete that's causing the issues. NIST has a whole page of references for internal curing of concrete. Are yeah. they, I can't even read through every, they got a list of all kinds of studies done. It's super absorbent polymers and that kind of thing. Yeah, there's all kinds of studies being done because they know that's where the curing of this issue is really buried, is you need to have internally cured concrete. It needs, concrete needs to be self-curing. Because if it's done, you don't even need a curing agent. That's the other thing. I've seen concrete being placed, and the one that was done in Oregon, and I was really impressed because they placed the concrete and the surface stayed damp for hours. So basically, it was producing its own water during the hydration process. And then I said, what I'd love to do, because if I'm correct in my, in my hypothesis here, I believe the concrete will be almost waterproof within two weeks. As this gentleman went out to go to a tested country after two weeks, but unfortunately it rained that day and he was waiting. And gee, rain in Oregon. Imagine that. <laughs> I, th 
So anyway, he found a couple of dry spots and he took the tramix meter and put it down. He said, I'll be damned, Bob. It's, it's 4.7 on the tramix meter. Two week old concrete. It should have been up around six, 6.9, not 4.7. And that, because that averages out the first three quarters of an inch of the concrete. So it's okay. actually drier towards the surface. So that, in my opinion, is ready to, as soon as the surface is dry from where you don't see any uh, water on it, blow a fan across it for about an hour, you can install a floor. Two weeks. Wow. Yeah, we've Not talked about that on a couple episodes. Internal curing and if it's done right. Yeah, you don't have to wait. But see, we can't do surface curing anymore because it doesn't get the job done anymore. We have to rethink our entire approach because the concrete we're dealing with today is not the concrete that was established when the curing standards were made. When the curing standards were made in 1950, and they haven't changed. Even with a different product. Changed again. It changed again dramatically between 2002 and 2018. When the came out in 2019, no more out, low alkali cement. That's when everything changed. We're now dealing with a new product. This Portland cement is not the Portland cement of 1950. It's not even the Portland cement of 1980. It's not the. It's not any Portland cement prior to 2002. It is different now. Right. All because of the cement. Yes. And with the cement kiln us, it is now different in each area where the cement is being produced, it'd be really nice if we can get a, an alkalinity baseline in each one of those producers. I don't think they'd be very forthcoming about that, but it would be nice if we could do that. Yeah. yeah we would have to do that in, at a, each plant. Yes. There's only a, a couple of companies out there producing <laughs> cement. They got it all wrapped up. They 40 plants total. Yeah. Over what, two companies? Probably. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a bit of a monopoly, if you could say. Du a duopoly? A duopoly, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes. Mm. And, uh, but each plant has to be evaluated because their, the, the mineral extraction is different. It, right. So we should have a localized uh, baseline so we don't have to, how to deal with it. Because some won't take as much effort as others. So and, that, yeah. So each plant is probably using different uh, grinding agents too, right? Yes. Because it depends on the mineral. If it's a harder, softer mineral, they would use a different grinding agent. Yeah. How much? How much cement kiln dust is getting in the cement? I've looked that up, and I cannot find any numbers on it. But once upon a time. It was brought up that they just said a percentage of the kiln dust being reintroduced. I don't know what that percentage is, and they don't, and they're not uh, being very forthcoming about what the percentage is. What percentage that is of the cement itself? I don't know. Because they produce a lot of cement kiln dust, right? It's yes. It's, there's a lot to handle for them. Yeah, and it can, and if they recycle it, it can be usable because it can be used in, in sub basis and things of that nature, because it can be a really beneficial uh, material because there's some products out there and, and there's other chemicals out there that are, they're called pH responsive. So if you get a re pH responsive attitude and you put in with this waste kiln dust, you can actually create bricks and it's all kind of a non concrete paver out of it just for like secondary roads and that kind of thing. But I don't know how much that's being explored. Huh. Interesting. Did we, do we hit on every point that you wanted to make today? About yes. This topic. Yeah. Cause so many, cause one of the, one of the tests they do in the flooring industry is they put in the RH pro. What I, don't like about that is one, it doesn't tell you how much moisture is in there. It can't. 
because it, it just measures airspace. And the other thing, if they drill it in two inches and completely bypasses a problem area. Why are you testing where the concrete's good? They want good results. Yeah, exactly. I saw this other push where there were some in the concrete industry trying to promote E96 as, a, as a, an evaluation of cement, the concrete permeability. They're going to slice off the top edge of the concrete and evaluate it. I don't know if it's by design or by ignorance of the chemistry, but that's a trick. Because if concrete's alkaline enough, and you use an E96, uh, which uses a desiccant or it uses an evaporative uh, force, what will happen is you will get good results if the concrete's really alkaline because it doesn't evaporate. The water doesn't evaporate readily if the alkalinity is high because it's mm -hmm. a force. It's, this is drawing and this is drawing. So they cancel each other out. Oh, look how good it is. Boy, we're not drawing any moisture out of there. It could be saturated. Yeah, I've been on jo jobs where the concrete cures it. Like, you know, if you were baking a cake and uh, you, you put the oven on too hot and it burns the outside and keeps the inside all moist and everything, doesn't it's, bake the, yeah. the in, inside. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so. that, that's a terrible uh, situation to be in. Or we're baking a lot of cakes out there. Yeah. And we could keep on talking because there's, a, there's admixtures and different things that are being added to specifications to, to address protecting the rebar. And that's probably not helping our cause either. Yeah. Because they're, they, they, they don't look at cause and effect. And unfortunately, one of the trends I've seen over the last 30 years, which is really unfortunate, is they're evaluating first in the laboratory, and then they go in the field. Then they keep bumping their head and go, well, why this happened? Why this happened? Why this happened? One of the reasons why I liked the, uh, the, the one product, and I, I won't mention here because, again, that'd be proprietary, but he tested it out on his own concrete, and he did so for over 10 years. He's a concrete yeah. finisher. The guy, so he was putting out down his own concrete. He experimented on himself. So when it was perfected and started working where he wasn't getting met cracking, wasn't getting any curling, then he knew he had a product. Then he brought it into the university study. And that's where Purdue did that study. When I saw that they, where they did the admixture and then just a spray finish, not a curing compound, but a spray finish, they didn't need to cure it and the concrete surface was actually denser than the remainder of the concrete. I told him, I've never seen this before. That's cool. It's a cool product. Been trying to poke holes in it. Haven't been successful in that yet. No, I haven't either. And I tried for almost two years to poke holes in it. Yeah. Good deal. I think we'll end our alkalinity discussion today. Uh, usually at the end of the episode, Robert, I usually let you share how folks can get a hold of you. And I always give that information out to our folks that follow the podcast. And also when I email our weekly newsletter out and you've been on the podcast before and you're not a guy that's hiding. So I think everybody knows how to get a hold of you. <laughs> but I think what would be cool today is if you don't mind sharing that charity you shared with me yesterday. Well, yeah, I very much thank you for doing that. <clears throat> I contribute to a single charity. It's called Kids Rock the Nation. It was started by a, a gentleman by the name of his, his stage name is Anthony Wild, but it's actually Anthony Klepper. He was a musician locally in the da Daytona, Florida area who got cancer and it was going to kill it. He had no insurance. He had no way to pay for it. But a doctor basically took him under his wing and saved his life. He said, how can I ever repay you? He said, by passing this board, by helping kids is a good start. So what Anthony looked at, he saw that a lot of these kids, especially the underprivileged kids, had no 
outlet for their energy. So he thought, why don't we start providing them with, with musical instruments and, and see how this does? He started doing it, and right from the get-go, it was successful. The kids became focused. They got better in school. So that idea grew into something. And when I moved here in 2012, I saw, I noticed this, and I kept observing what he was doing. And I was so impressed. I thought, this is the way we got to go. So I started donating the guitars I had. I've donated at least 30 guitars so far, a couple PA systems you know, that went to some of these schools and some of these individual kids, because not only do they give it to individual children, but they give it to these school districts that don't have the budget to get musical instruments. That, And this is happening around the country now. And what is really cool is they have now gifted over 2,000 children the gift of music. And one of the very first ones back in 2013 just got signed by Sony Records. This child had no direction, was given a guitar, and they, sh and they showed an aptitude towards it, so they continued to help him because they don't just give him something and then abandon him. They, they will work with him, especially the ones that continue to show interest. He's now a professional musician. <laughs> That's awesome. Successful career. I was so excited. I had a couple of cherished, actually several cherished uh, musical uh, memorabilia that I had, and I donated those as well. The, the one with the biggest impact was I had one of B.B. King's guitars. Now, B.B. King, he was one of the most generous people I've ever met. I got to meet him. I got to talk with him. He's one of those kind where you're sitting there in a room with him, you're the only person there. That's how engaging he is. He donated several of his guitars, and I purchased one in a CHOP Kids Charity in San Diego. So basically, when I donated it to this charity, it just went full circle. So it yeah. was because, or he put it this way, but now that after B. King passed, the guitar was worth a fortune. So what they were able to do is get the equivalent of gifting kids guitars and musical instruments for the next 10 years off that one donation. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. And anybody here in this podcast, look them up and I'll tell you what, we need to get this around the country really strong because we have a bunch of professional musicians jumping on board with this and this has really been successful and a hundred percent of the proceeds go right to the kids. We'll put it, their uh, website in the show notes, kidsrockthenation.org. I was blown away when you shared that story yesterday. I didn't even know that existed. Hopefully someone or some folks that are listening to this will uh, reach out. And again, I thought that was pretty cool, Robert, and, and what you're doing with them. So that's awesome. All right. Yeah. So I think we'll end the episode today. Remember, folks, the future of concrete is not set in stone. It's up to us to shape it. Follow us on whatever podcast app you like to follow us on, please check out the website, concretelogicpodcast.com. And uh, Robert, thanks again for doing the I show. Do, I do want to add one more thing. If we take the concrete design th with the admixture and the topical that we're talking about, I believe that we can produce concrete that will rival uh, Roman concrete in its ability to withstand hundreds of years, not decades. Yeah. Now, how much greener and more sustainable can you be? I don't know. We keep beating that drum on this podcast, Robert. Hopefully it'll sink in soon. I hope so. <laughs> oh. And that concludes another episode of the Concrete Logic Podcast. I hope you got some value out of that episode and learned a thing or two. If you did, visit our website, ConcreteLogicPodcast.com. Click on the Show Support tab and learn how you could be listed as a producer of an episode. Again, that's ConcreteLogicPodcast.com. Click on Show Support tab to learn how you can support the show. And as always, Mike Dutton will take us out. I
put some diesel in the lights and wait till the trucks roll up. Yeah, this ain't how most folks live their lives.